Hello, my name is Elizabeth Veliki, and today I will be discussing my ongoing project called the Memoir Database, measuring anthropogenic markings on 3D ochre surface renderings. To begin, I want to discuss what exactly I mean by markings. In archaeology, markings made by humans that we see on certain artifacts are often referred to as use traces. This is important because when we see use traces or markings, we have direct evidence that humans were actively engaging with these materials. And by studying these use traces, we can begin to understand how they were engaging with them. This is particularly important for coloring materials or ochre because the colorful pigments that these materials can create are often linked to the earliest forms of symbolic expression, language, and advanced cognition. Now you may have noticed that I use this word ochre quite a bit and I will throughout this presentation. For those of you who don't know, in archaeology, we use the term ochre to refer to any stone, rock, clay, dirt, or sediment that has a color and can be used to make paint. And not all rocks can do this. It can depend on the type of environment it was formed in, the minerals that are in them, and other variables. So as you might have guessed, these materials can be a bit elusive and difficult to identify when you're excavating in an archaeological site. However, one feature that sort of unifies this umbrella term ochre is that all of these materials tend to have a lot of iron, and this is the primary element that makes them colorful. And ancient humans, even as far back as 300,000 years ago, knew this about ochre and exploited it. So studying the ways humans used ochre throughout time can inform us on aspects of their behavioral and cultural evolution. Now, ochre is an earth mineral and was usually collected in the form of raw nodules or rocks. These were transported back to sites, and in many cases, we simply find these raw unmodified nodules. However, we believe that the primary reason humans collected ochre was to create pigments or paint out of them. But how exactly does one do this? Ochre can turn into pigment in several ways, most notably grinding, pulverizing, scraping, or scoring. And these actions are invasive or destructive in different ways, and they leave characteristic use traces on ochre artifacts. Previous experiments on ochre use traces have focused primarily on the nature, presence, and locations of these use traces based on subjective visual inspections. In these previous studies, the analytical variables have either related to the behaviors that created them, such as grinding, scoring, or pulverizing, or the differences in the types of materials used such as coarse or fine grain grinding stones. However, there have been no experimental studies up to date that have focused on quantitatively characterizing and classifying ochre surface modifications in a standardized and consistent way. Furthermore, the classification of certain use traces varies by researcher and by time period and by site. So even though we are all studying the same material using similar techniques, we're not all speaking the same language. We initially started upon this work in an earlier study when we accidentally trapped a large piece of ochre from Blombo's cave in South Africa in a micromorphological block section. Because the piece was so large, we did a number of analyses on it, including micro CT scanning and 3D modeling. Here is where we learned the value of quantitatively analyzing and classifying these surface modifications in a standardized way. Because in this study, we learned that what we had been calling one type of modification, scoring, was in some cases very similar to another modification type called grinding. And these behaviors are very different with a different type of tool and resulting in a different amount of pigment powder. Yet, they were leaving the same use traces. And this formed the concept for the Memoir database. The goals of the database are as follows to develop a protocol for how use traces on ochre artifacts can be documented through high resolution 3D data sets that are intuitive and user friendly, to formulate an ochre specific analytical protocol of how to document and extract morphometric information from these 3D data sets, to use these data and variables to conduct statistical tests and classifications that can help to answer archeologically relevant questions, and lastly, to build an open access archive of visual, spatial, and numerical data, where we link specific use word types to physical, material, and behavioral variables. And this last point is the overarching goal of this project, because we understood that limiting the scope of these experiments to only our expertise, only our archeological materials, 
and only our experiments was not going to be enough. The more information, experiences, and variables we could include, the more robust our observations and future comparisons to archaeological materials could be. So this first step was to develop a protocol to how we can execute these experiments. And we wanted to do it in a way that was straightforward, user-friendly, and not highly technical, because we wanted this protocol to be accessible to researchers without access to fancy technical equipment, such as a micro CT scanner or a confocal microscope. First, we organize our materials for the early tests. We aim to keep it simple. We wanted to test exclusively score marks or incisions made with a tool and ochre pieces. We took three types of ochre that I described as hard, medium, and soft. Next, we took common tool types that we find at Blombo's Cave, specifically silkrete and quartzite. Lastly, we decided to use these tools to create incisions at three different levels of pressure, one, two, and three kilograms. And we measured this by doing the incisions on a scale and recording the process. An example of this recording is in the video presented here. Here you can see us creating the incisions at three kilos, two kilos, and one kilo. Now, right now I'm presenting this sort of streamlined version of the study to you. There were many trials and errors, um, but those I'm happy to elaborate more on during the Q&A. But you can see in this video, it was difficult to maintain a consistent pressure throughout creating these scoring marks on the ochre pieces. In order to document the incisions, we use a focus stacking microphotogrammetry setup. We opted for this because microphotogrammetry is relatively inexpensive, it is portable and adjustable for artifacts of different sizes, it doesn't require access to specialized equipment or dedicated technicians, it can provide high resolution images, and we can do it all ourselves in our offices or at home, which was particularly useful during the pandemic. Our specific setup includes a macro lens, digital camera, stepper motor enabled macro rail and rotary table, stacking photo software, photogrammetry software, and GIS software. All of the specific models and programs that we have are in parentheses on the right. And what this setup does is it enables us to take individual high resolution, multi-stack photos close up to the incisions that we are studying. Furthermore, we take a series of photos of the ochre surfaces at an angle of 60 degrees and at 18 unique positions. Each position is photographed with the macro two to one setting. The whole process, which is fully automatic, takes 810 photos and around 40 minutes to complete. Once the images are taken, each stack takes around one minute to process, totaling in 18 minutes. And then the alignment of the 18 focus stacked photos in Agisoft takes about 15 minutes. So just over an hour for each surface rendering. This whole process took a while to refine, but the results and the output is worth the wait. We then have a workable 3D image as well as a digital elevation model or DEM. And on this DEM, we can take direct measurements on the use traces you see here and document their morphometric data. So far, the data variables that we are recording include hardness, implement, surface preparation, scoring motion, and pressure. Now, half of this battle was trying to find a way to categorize this information that will make it accessible for everyone. But the question was, which aspect actually holds all of this key information? We realized it was the actual incisions or lines themselves, because each line can be made by a different tool with a different pressure using different techniques all on one ochre surface. So we constructed a database in FileMaker Pro that would record key information surrounding each of the modifications. This included data about the type of ochre used, which we labeled as 01, 02, and 03, the tool types used and their characteristics, as well as the space for the photo, and these were labeled as T1 and T2, the nature of the lines in their creations, the pressure used if we had documented the surface photo in DEM, and etc. This will all compress into a single identifying code listed as such. So we know the ochre type, the tool type, which line it is, and the characteristics of each of these lines. 
Then each of these lines contains the data their profiles measured on them. The goal here is to upload this entry format into an online platform so that if people want to contribute, it will be using the same universal parameters so that all of our data will be comparable. The development of this database and protocol setup has taken quite a lot of time, but we do have some pilot data that I will briefly go over here. These concern the initial measurements on the height, width, and angle measurements of each of the markings, following the Bellow method, which is widely used for measuring cut marks on bone. I will present the data from six lines on a medium hard piece of ochre made with a quartzite flake at three different pressures, as well as two grinding striations that result from when you grind the ochre against a larger surface, in this case, a flat granite rock. And you can see some of the other grinding striations on the surface of this piece of ochre here. We also noticed that during the creation of these incisions, the two and three kilo lines have a small part where they overlap. So we thought, why not? And included this as well and labeled it as wide. We also include measurements from a hard ochre piece with just three incisions at three, two, and one kilograms of pressure. So this chart shows the measurements for hard and medium ochre with the different pressures applied, as well as grinding striations and what we call the wide scorings. Not to our surprise, the height of the profiles increased with higher pressure. This coincides with grinding striations being very shallow in general, and the wide scorings are the deepest, likely because we went over them twice. Here we are looking at the width of the profiles, which, like height, shows increased profile width with higher incision pressure. The grinding striations are again narrower than all of the incisions with any pressure. However, unlike height, the wide marks do not show a significant difference from the three kilo pressure incisions. Lastly, when we look at angle, it's the inverse pattern from height and width, with the lower pressure incisions having the widest angle. We also notice that with increased profile height, the angle seemed to decrease. Lastly, the wide incisions, again, do not differ greatly from the three kilo pressure incisions. After measuring all of these profile shapes, we noticed that there were a lot of subtle differences in each of their profile morphologies, and we started to question our methodology. First, we wondered if there is a better way to account for these subtleties in profile shape. Are we missing key information by only measuring height, width, and angle? Based on this, is there a better way to take more measurement detail from the profile shapes that goes beyond measuring just these three variables? And lastly, what does this say about human behavior? By accounting for more variation, are there behavioral aspects that would come to light with increased measurement sensitivity? So our most recent step is to use ArcGIS to transform the line profile measurements into shapes. Here, we can take more specific measurements on each of the total profile shapes in order to identify any unique or characteristic features that we might be overlooking by only measuring height, width, and angle. This is actually still a work in progress and we are actively working on it. So hopefully next time we can say more about whether this is a more viable way to study nuances and profile shape. Because ultimately, we are using these data to explore questions on archeological materials. Are there more to these incisions that we are not seeing with the naked eye? Were these markings haphazard or thoroughly planned out and executed repeatedly? Were the makers right or left-handed? How much pressure were they using and were they creating these marks solely for pigment production, for enjoyment, or for other reasons? Ultimately, we want to learn which measurements can possibly inform on these behavioral aspects. And we want this to be applicable to ochre studies from other sites, time periods, and regions. And that is why our goal is to make this database an open contribution network where our observations can be shared, compared, and analyzed. It's still a work in progress, but ultimately we want to build a platform where OCA researchers from around the world can use each other's data to help support their research and interpretations. And maybe we'll learn a little bit more about these behaviors in the past. So with that, I thank you for listening to my presentation and I'm happy to go over questions in the Q&A session.